pere, 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 Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Crap Cafe. By this point, you probably know me from my spicy One Piece theories, but today we're going to be doing my very first character analysis. And to commemorate this moment, we're going to go big. In fact, we're going to go as big as I can. For this video, we'll be examining the legendary giant warriors, Dory and Bragi, and quite literally analyzing their character. As from the moment they were introduced on Little Garden, Oda has gone out of his way to question whether their warrior pride and beliefs are an asset or a mentality that will drag them and everyone around them down with them. And by the end of the arc, Oda never really gave us a firm answer. But by examining them and their impact on the story, we should be able to come to our own conclusions. And by the end of the video, you may be shocked to find out just how big of an impact these giants have made on the story. Now, of course, as a Soge stock investor, I do have to inform you of some of my inherent biases. Obviously, I do have to ride for my boys, but I will do my very best to remain impartial. So, for today's video, you can call me Judge Trent, and if you would like to become a Soge stock investor as well, start by clicking the subscribe button to keep up with my recent videos. And if you just think I'm really nifty, then consider becoming a member. You'll receive early access to videos, and so much more. Currently, it's just me and Mr. Bushido, so if you'd like to give us some company, please consider supporting the channel. Personally, Dory and Bragi hold a special place in my heart, mostly because as a kid, they were the first characters on the Grand Line that truly took my breath away. In just the span of a few episodes, we go from a fun pirate adventure to an immense fantasy world, with everything from living dinosaurs to real giants. Their existence opened up a whole new world of possibilities. Not only that, but Dory and Bragi were every bit as awesome as they appeared. But before we begin discussing their actions and beliefs, I think we should take a moment to address the giant elephant in the room. You see, Dory and Bragi both belong to the race of giants, one of the many fun and fantastical races of the One Piece world. However, this race differs more from the others, as along with their Goliath stature, they also possess incredibly long lifespans, and on average, can live for over 300 years, which is three times the span of a regular human life in the world of One Piece. In fact, these long lifespans are a large part of the reason I'm making this video now, as many of the effects and ramifications of Dory and Bragi's actions have been lost to time. You see, Dory and Bragi were 158 years old, or about 52 when you convert it to human years, at the time of their introduction, but they began rampaging on the sea over a hundred years before, when they were the active co-captains of the Giant Warrior Pirates, a band of sun-worshipping Elbafian giants, sailing the sea in search of glory and adventure. However, while they managed to rack up a hundred million berry bounty pretty early on, they and the giant warrior pirates would only sail for a short time before their adventure came to a sudden end. But what could bring this mighty crew to their knees? Well, one day, while they were restocking supplies on a random island on the Grand Line, roughly 100 years from the start of the story, the two decided to show off the impressive beast that they had hunted down. However, there was an onlooker to this display that asked a single question that was able to bring the giant warrior's journey to a screeching halt. And it's a question as old as time. Whose is bigger? Now, I'm not going to let this video devolve into a length versus girth discussion, but if you would be interested in something like that, then please let me know in the comments, because I do have some research that I've been waiting to share with you. But for now, let's just say that the two had some comparable specimens. And after many long arguments, the two Elbathian giants decided to settle their differences the only way an Elbathian giant knows how. As Dory explains, if two warriors from Elbath can't reach an agreement, then they will be judged by the god of Elbath and be forced to bite each other to the death. You see, the giants of Elbath worship the sun god, or as we've more recently come to call them, Nika. While we don't know much about this ancient figure, it's evident that the giants revere them as a great warrior as they honor him by using trial by combat, and whoever is the victor is considered divinely chosen by Nika. Now, this is certainly a questionable ideology, but Dory and Bragi somehow managed to make it look good. 
You see, these two have been locked in their life or death duel for the past 100 years, and each fight has come down to an even draw. It's been so long that the two massive sea kings they caught have long decomposed, remaining only as ivory mountains on the forested terrain, and the random island that they landed on would come to be named after them, receiving the title of Little Garden, as a reference to how the two tower over everything else in the island, making it look as though the Jurassic Island is nothing more than a little garden to the giants. And they even admit to having forgotten the reason behind their bout long ago. Despite this fact, they still continued on with their lethal battles, day in and day out, and totaling 73,470 draws before Dory would eventually fall in battle, but only due to injuries he received from Baroque work sabotage. And by the end of the arc, the two would end up shattering their battered weapons as they saw the straw hats off the island. And left weaponless, the two Elbafian giants seemingly decided that Nika must have simply blessed them both, and they started making plans to return to their homeland. Throughout the arc, certain characters like Luffy and Usopp were completely enamored with their display of courage in the face of death, as well as their ability to fight with every ounce of strength to an even draw over countless battles even despite the fact that they had forgotten the reason behind their awesome duel. But Oda, as he often does, made sure to include both perspectives, and used characters like Nami and Vivi to highlight the faults in their ideology. Vivi specifically calls out how they've wasted their time, and that there's no point in continuing to fight without a motive. Even if 100 years is only a third of a giant's overall lifespan, wasting your time on an old grudge isn't a healthy or productive use of time. However, by the end of the arc, Oda never really gives us a direct answer as to whether Dory or Brocky were stubborn fools or righteous warriors. Well, I plan to finally get to the bottom of this question personally, and to do so, I'm going to be going through the series with a fine-tooth comb in order to fully understand every ramification of Dory and Brocky's 100-year duel. <laughs> Starting with those closest to our beloved giant captains, we'll begin with their loyal crewmates. And by observing their life after Dory and Bragi, we can start to get a picture of some of the first ramifications of their hundred year duel. Once the first bout began, all of the other giants on the crew were forced to leave the island in order to respect the battle and the laws of Elbath. And while at the time Little Garden was first being released, that's where their story ended. However, now that we're about a thousand chapters away from that point, we can actually track exactly what happened to the crew after leaving Little Garden. It was revealed in Big Mom's backstory that while the crewmates were forced to wait for a victor of the duel, they aimlessly raided the Grand Line without their captains, causing havoc and showing the world the incredible strength of the giant race, until they got careless and were eventually captured by the marines. Here, we can see the first and most immediate effect of Dorian Bragi's duel as in such a short period of time without their captains, the entire crew was captured, and could easily have been executed on the spot. And Dory and Bragi would have returned 100 years later to some terrible news. Thankfully, however, Mother Caramel, Charlotte Linland's adopted mother, stepped in and saved the giants from being executed, managing to convince the kind-hearted marines to simply send the giants home to Elbath. Shockingly, the marines relented, and Mother Caramel escorted the giant pirates back to their homeland, earning their lifelong respect and gratitude. Once the crew returned to Elbath, they had no other choice but to wait for one of their captains to return from their duel, as not only did they prove that without the strength and leadership of Dory and Bragi, the crew would only be picked off one by one. But it also appears that no other giant pirate crews would emerge from the island for several decades likely due to a newfound fear of the outside world, or simply out of respect for Dorian Bragi, whose fate was still unknown to the giants of Elbath. And it's there that they waited for an obscene 50 years, before their most loyal followers, Oimo and Kashi, decided that it would be a good idea to set off in search of their captains and check in on them, as they believed that the battle should surely be done by that point. But rather unfortunately for the pair, before they could ever make it back to Little Garden, they were captured by the marines yet again. And with Mother Caramel now living on the outskirts of Elbath, there was truly no one left to save them. But this wouldn't be the end of them, and they managed to escape the chopping block, in exchange for their servitude. But the overall result may have been just as heinous as death. 
It would seem that someone in the Marines 50 years ago came up with a clever ploy to trick Oimo and Kashi into believing that the legendary giant warrior captains had already been captured by the world government and were currently imprisoned. While completely untrue, this gambit worked, and Oimo and Kashi agreed to serve the world government and guard the gates of Eni's lobby for 100 years in exchange for the release of their captains. After all, what's 100 years when you can live to 300? This marks our first true ramification, as Oimo and Kashi would go on to serve the government for several decades, ensuring the demise of certain characters like Frankie's adopted father Tom, as well as countless other low-level pirates and enemies of the state. The two did their job so diligently that Innie's lobby became known for being an impenetrable government fortress, and they almost aided the world government in their efforts to capture Nico Robin, almost giving them the keys to destroy the world. Thankfully, only 50 years into their 100 years of servitude, the Straw Hat Alliance came through and broke down the impenetrable walls of Innie's lobby, saving Nico Robin and voiding the world government's empty promise. And while Oimo and Kashi were initially crushed by the idea of possibly failing their captains, Usopp proved why he's the best straw hat yet again and revealed to the two that Dory and Bragi are not only still free, but were actively battling on Little Garden until just recently. This revelation managed to turn the tide of the battle, and both Oimo and Kashi turned on the world government, allying with the Straw Hat Alliance and indebting themselves to Usopp. After the battle on Eni's lobby ended, we saw that they returned to Water 7 with Gali Law, with the plans of getting a new ship and setting out to find their masters on Little Garden. And now, over 700 chapters later, we actually saw their goal come to fruition, as we got to see them and Dorian Bragi living and adventuring side by side yet again. But already, we can see the first waves of the impact that Dorian Bragi's absence has left on the story. And while it seems that every member of the crew at least survived without their captains, we can't say that there were no immediate consequences, as not only did Oimo and Kashi end up serving the world government for almost 50 years, seeing to the death of countless souls who passed through Innie's lobby, but if it wasn't for the Straw Hat crew's fearlessness, allowing them to scoff at the notion of an impenetrable island, then the world government could have ended up capturing Nico Robin, one of the only people in the world capable of deciphering the Poneglyph and resurrecting the ancient weapons. However, it wouldn't really be fair to judge them on what if, so for now, we'll only be counting all of the poor souls who Oimo and Kashi damned, as well as almost 50 years of free labor on their part. But there was actually another consequence that managed to sneak past without ever truly revealing itself. Mother Caramel, the young woman who saved the giants from execution and accompanied them to the homeland, is actually one of the most evil characters within all of the One Piece series. <laughs> Mother Caramel's true identity is that of the Mountain Witch, a notorious underworld broker, dealing specifically in the trafficking of orphans, seemingly selling her adopted children off to the highest bidder. And of course, her number one customer was none other than the world government. Now, if you've seen my Kuro Theory video, you'll remember just how much the world government loves orphans. Certain organizations like Cypherpole 9 and Zero are almost entirely composed of them, which is why after seeing the great strength of the giant warrior pirates 100 years ago, the world government began hatching schemes to acquire a giant fighting force of their own. Even Big Mom believed that with the aid of an army of giants, nothing could keep her from becoming Pirate King. But while Big Mom failed to recruit even a single giant, we see giants in the Navy to this very day. So how in the world did the world government manage to recruit so many giant soldiers? Well, after seeing the raw power of the giants, the world government came up with three tactics to acquire some for themselves. First was trying to genetically engineer a giant from a human, but as Caesar explains in Punk Hazard, the concept of transforming even children into giants permanently is impossible, which is why he created his addictive growth candy to keep the subject coming back for repeat doses. We can actually see some of the failed giant experiments of the world government in the freezer on Punk Hazard. The next tactic was trickery, as with Oimo and Kashi and how they simply lied and tricked them into serving for 50 years. And while effective, it did eventually backfire on them. 
and their last tactic was actually the first plan they initiated, but took the longest to develop, and while it was tremendously effective, it was arguably the most evil tactic of the bunch. Once the Navy managed to put an end to the giant warrior pirates' rampage, they needed to figure out exactly what to do with the crew. Executing them would be a waste, and it was highly doubtful that even a single one of the proud Elbathian giants would simply agree to serve the world government in exchange for their own life. So, the Navy and the world government came up with a clever yet devious plan. Reaching out to one of their contacts in the underworld by the name of the Mountain Witch, they concocted a scheme. At the planned execution of the giant warrior pirates, Mother Caramel was to arrive at the scene and make a tremendous plea for the world government to spare the giants and allow her to escort them back to their homeland. While the government would normally never allow a pirate to go free, this time they let them go, as they planned to have Mother Caramel settle down in the outskirts of Elbath and set up her orphan selling shop, the Sheep's House, just outside of the giant village, in hopes that over time she could adopt orphan giants and feed the government info about the ongoings of the giant island. And unfortunately, this plan worked flawlessly, and after the stage rescue, they felt eternally grateful to Caramel and began calling her their holy mother. And Jarl and Jorl, the co-leaders of Elbath, allowed her to open up what they believed to simply be an orphanage for odd and abandoned children. But in actuality, the mountain witch cared nothing for her children. In her mind, they were simply a potential paycheck from the government. Throughout her 50 years in Elbath, she would go on to sell several giant children to the world government to be trained as marines, sending batches of children every two years to avoid raising suspicions. This included characters such as John Giant, and likely the rest of the giants who fought for the Marines during the Marineford War. And due to the poor oversight of the aging Yorl and Yarl, Mother Caramel and the world government managed to pick and choose giant soldiers as they pleased, arming the world government with an entire giant squadron. And there's truly no telling the massive toll that's been taken on the wider One Piece world. But we did see them used to ensure one of the most impactful moments of the story, and almost ended our protagonist's journey early. But if this result was caused by a lack of oversight from Yorl and Jarl, then why am I bringing it up in regards to Dorian Bragi? Well, you see, Dorian Bragi's absence did more than allow Mother Caramel to return to Elbath with the giants as their precious savior. But as it's clear from the duality of the former giant warrior co-captains and current elders of the village, and our current giant warrior co-captains, that at some point, Dory and Bragi were meant to replace them in their leadership role in the village. The elders would have retired, and Dory and Bragi would have taken their role in the village, leaving room for a new set of captains for the crew, as Jarl and Jorl once did for them. However, because Dory and Bragi never returned, the aging pair was forced to keep going, until eventually getting to a point when they were literally the oldest giant leaders on record. Oh, sorry, wrong slide. But like every job, after a certain age, problems start to pop up. The old warriors became weak and fragile, and even with the sheep's house just outside of one of the main villages, the elders clearly neglected to keep tabs on the orphanage. Perhaps none of these issues would have occurred if Dory and Bragi had been present. Their leadership and youthful vigor could have stripped the world government of a tremendous amount of military power and kept dozens of children from being bought and sold like goods. But the most significant impact of the Sheep's House actually has nothing to do with the giants of Elbath, but a young human girl who was abandoned there by her parents, only to become a monster like no other. As far as we're aware, Charlotte Linlin was born to two human parents, and while she herself was born a regular-sized human baby, she rapidly grew and by the age of five, she was already towering over her mother and father. Her massive size and strength posed many problems for her regular-sized parents. However, it posed a much bigger problem to all of the citizens of the towns that she destroyed during even her earliest of hunger pains. You see, whenever Big Mom has a hankering for a certain kind of food, she can't simply move past it as a normal person might. Instead, Big Mom must eat that food in order to satisfy herself, which... Kinda sounds like me after a night out, but in the case of Big Mom, there tends to be far more screaming and bloodshed. We even got to see this firsthand with the whole debacle of Whole Cake Island. 
However, as annoying as it was for us to watch, I imagine it was a lot more annoying to live. And eventually, the other townsfolk outvoted the exhausted parents, and Big Mom was exiled to the island of Elbath when she was only five years old. But in order to give her the greatest chance of survival, her parents made sure to leave her with a certain famed Holy Mother, known for raising wild and unwanted children. But from the moment Mother Caramel laid eyes on Linlin, she saw nothing but her final score. With Big Mom now her only priority, Caramel simply did her best to keep her from killing any of the Elbathian wildlife, beating up any of the adult giants, or tearing the limbs off of any of her adopted siblings. But Linlin was a truly unruly child, and some forces of nature simply can't be stopped. One evening, on the eve of the winter solstice, Linlin and the other children of the sheep's house were invited to the village to take part in a celebration. However, this celebration would mark the beginning of another ramification of Dorian Bragi's 100-year war, the birth of Big Mom as we know her. You see, the winter solstice events in Elbath isn't your typical family barbecue. After a feast of Selma, which quickly became one of Linlin's favorite treats, the giants enter a 12-day fast, or otherwise known as a death sentence for Luffy, me, and anybody within the vicinity of Big Mom. But to be honest, we kind of have to give it to her, because to her credit, she made it a full seven days before her hunger pains began. Storming into the village, demanding someone help her to satisfy her cravings, she began her frighteningly relentless pursuit of sweet treats burning the town to ashes and injuring several giants in her way. Big Mom eventually came face to face with Jarl and Jarl, the former co-captains of the giant pirates, and they planned to end Linlin's rampage once and for all. But that's when something truly terrible happened. Rushing in and shattering Jarl's blade before he could land a blow, Big Mom grabbed him by the beard and slammed the legendary giant over her shoulder, and Jarl's withered body simply couldn't handle the impact and he would soon pass from his injuries. An unfortunate end for the proud warrior. Even though this terrible act was committed by a child, the death of his best friend of over 300 years was something that Jarl simply could not forgive. Grabbing his blade with the intent to take her life for killing his best friend, Jarl went in for the kill. But just before he could make contact, Mother Caramel arrived throwing herself in front of the blade and stopping the giant in his tracks. Begging and pleading, Mother Caramel used every bit of the goodwill she had collected through her scrupulous means to bargain for Lin Lin's life, pleading that the giant simply let her take Lin Lin and leave the island, never to return again. And heartbroken, Yaro relented, banishing the two from the island. But this would only be the beginning of the end. Because no sooner than Caramel and the children of the sheep's house relocated to another nearby island did Mother Caramel call for a meeting with CP0 and began to leverage Linlin's amazing display of strength on Elbath to increase the amount she could possibly sell her for, arguing that even with the strength she has now, she could easily become a vice admiral or even one of Cypherpole's greatest assets. Reluctantly accepting the deal, the Cypherpole agent had to agree that her insane power warranted a higher price. But fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, Big Mom was never sold off to the world government to become a Marine. As on her sixth birthday, Mother Caramel surprised her with a wonderful tea party. But what truly caught Big Mom's eye was the enormous pile of croquembouche that Caramel had prepared. Thanking everyone for a dream come true, Lin Lin dove into the pile head first, devouring each bite like it would be her last. But after a flurry of cream and dough, the only one who remained at the table was Big Mom, seemingly cannibalizing the other children and her adopted mother, leaving her all alone on the island with nothing but Mother Caramel's devil fruit powers as a keepsake. This tragic event traumatized Big Mom, who believed that she had been abandoned by those closest to her yet again leading her to try and reassemble her assorted family later in life. With the creation of Totland, Big Mom's distorted concept of a wonderland for all the races of the world, and the island that this terrible event took place on would one day become Big Mom's home base, in the capital of Totland, known as Whole Cake Island, meaning that we can basically accredit Dory and Bragi for the rise of one of the most frightening pirates on the sea as if they had been on Elbath to adopt and train a young Charlotte Linlin instead of her being found by Mother Caramel, it's possible that she could have grown up to become a force for good in the world. 
It might even explain why Oda went out of his way to show us Olin and Wano, a kind and mother-like version of the notorious Big Mom. Maybe this was a possible alternate version of the character, from a timeline where things went a little better for her. But as I said, we can't count what-ifs here, so for now, we'll be adding the things that we can directly tie to Dory and Bragi, such as the death of Jarl, whom they were meant to have replaced, the strengthening of the world government by the giant's mother Caramel sold to the navy, and the tragic event that led to the collapse of the sheep's house, and the birth of the Yonko, Big Mom, as well as her territory of Totland in the New World. Hmm. You know, now that I take a moment to look at everything I've mentioned so far, I think that in my pursuit of impartiality, I may have forgotten to consider the positive outcomes of their 100-year duel as well. So, did any good come from Dorian Bragi being absent from Elbath? The New Giant Warrior Pirates are a collection of young giants who grew up in Elbath on tales of the previous generation of Giant Warrior Pirates. Led by Haruden, this faction left Elbath some 20 to 30 years ago with the goal of reviving the Giant Warrior Pirates. And while the group respected Dorian Bragi simply based on the tales that they had heard about them in their youth, they didn't know them well enough to resist their urge for adventure and wait for them to return to pass on their positions to a new generation. So donning the very creative title of New Giant Warrior Pirates, a small group consisting of some familiar faces from Big Mom's flashback, such as Harudin, their captain, and Gerd, their doctor, as well as Rode, Stanson, and Goldberg. These five set off into the New World looking to live up to their predecessor's shadow. But I suppose they must have gotten off to a rough start as they ended up working for Buggy's delivery service during the time skip. But don't let the name fool you, the only thing these five were delivering was them hands. As Buggy's delivery service is nothing but a group of mercenaries for hire, fighting battles on behalf of those who can't. During the course of the two year time skip, they almost single handedly dragged Buggy's delivery service into a modicum of success, and they were Buggy's number one employees for the entire time they were a part of his organization. But when the opportunity presented itself for Harudin to possibly get his hands on Ace's Maramara fruit, he signed up for Doflamingo's Deadly Coliseum, alongside countless other opponents all seeking strength for their own personal reasons. And quite frankly, I would have loved to see our first ever giant Logia user, but Harudin was knocked out in the first round by Luffy, or should I say Lucy. But losing the battle would only be the beginning of his humiliation, as once he was escorted to the processing area for the losers, he was dropped into a secret underground holding area, made by Doflamingo, and was transformed into a toy by Sugar, erasing his existence from the world and leaving him completely unable to resist Sugar's orders. Forced to become a slave to the Doflamingo family and work in their underground warehouses, and another giant warrior captain would have gone missing in the Grand Line. But as Mother Caramel's divine assistance had once saved the giants 100 years ago, a certain handsome hero stepped up to the plate to save him and the countless other victims of the Doflamingo family. Valiantly defeating Sugar, the evil culprit behind the heinous act, releasing the countless people that Doflamingo had enslaved in his creepy basement, and uprooting Joker's weapon trading organization, sending the country into chaos as the citizens began to remember all of the people that Doflamingo had literally stolen from them and the first person to show Usopp the appreciation he deserved for such a remarkable accomplishment was Harudin, lifting him by his broken arms and doing his best to hold on to Usopp's limp body. Harudin held him high for all to look upon as they praised Usopp for freeing them, and after the Battle of Dressrosa was done, Harudin chose to abandon Buggy's crew and join the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, sending in his two-week notice on the spot. And since Whole Cake Island, this is really the last we've seen of them. Well, at least in the present day of the story, because just recently in Egghead, we were treated to a brief flashback into Vegapunk's life that not only allows us to narrow down the exact point in time in which the new giant warrior pirates first set sail, but also gives us a better look into the reason they left when they did. Our flashback begins with Vegapunk arriving on the freshly destroyed Ohara, just a few months after the Buster Call that destroyed the island. Seeing the untold destruction, Vegapunk made his way to the Tree of Knowledge, hoping that there would be some surviving trace of the books and research that the scholars had compiled over generations. Walking closer, he noticed a lake in the center of the island, and upon further inspection, he saw a mountain of knowledge safely tucked away underneath a layer of water. 
confirming that the scholars succeeded and O'Hara would live on through Vegapunk, Robin, and seemingly one other, as it would appear that Jaguar D. Saul managed to survive the bombardment after being trapped in Aokiji's ice, and seemingly he used his last bit of strength to call in a favor. Summoning the giants of Elbath to the island, he asked that they transport the discovered books to a safe location, and it was none other than the members of the new giant warrior pirates who came to the rescue. If you look closely, you can see Gerd, Goldberg, and Harudin carefully removing the books from the water, meaning we should be indebted to them for the preservation of all of this knowledge, as if they didn't choose to form a crew to sail all the way from Elbath in the New World to O'Hara in the West Blue, none of this could have happened. While this event was truly terrible for O'Hara, it's actually great for Dory and Bragi, because now we actually have a positive outcome of the 100 year duel. And while it's not quite enough to make up for everything so far, we do have a little more to examine, as the giant warrior pirate crew has resurfaced, and we've gotten to see Dory, Bragi, and the full crew in action for the first time. <laughs> Now that the crew has finally begun to inch closer to a possible arrival at Elbath, giants have started popping up in the story left and right. I mentioned a moment ago that the new giant warrior pirates made an appearance during the Egghead arc, but boy was I shocked when the entire OG giant warrior crew rolled up to Egghead to defend the Straw Hats from the Navy's onslaught. And while I'm ecstatic to see these two early One Piece characters thrive, it is shocking to see just how powerful they've become. But it does make some sense, as now that they've returned to Elbath, they've actually been able to get some brand new weapons. This power jump is simply what happens when they don't have to worry about their weapons shattering whenever they launch their strongest attacks. Which has seemingly skyrocketed them into a whole new league of power being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the strongest characters in the story. And I can say without a doubt that if the Straw Hats didn't have the entire giant pirate crew aiding them to escape the island right now, Luffy and the crew would have been caught dead to rights, bringing the Straw Hats' journey to an end. But thanks to the fact that the Straw Hats just so happened to be directed to Little Garden at the start of their adventure, Luffy and Usopp earned their respect. If not for that seemingly insignificant interaction, they never would have come to Egghead to rescue the Straw Hats. But looking even further back, the only reason Dory and Brocky, giants of Elbath, were still on Little Garden when the Straw Hats arrived was because of their 100-year duel. Meaning that if it wasn't for their 73,470 battles on Little Garden, they never would have met the Straw Hats 100 years later meaning Usopp would never have been able to recruit Oimo and Kashi during the buster call of Eni's lobby, possibly giving the world government the edge in the battle. Which would bring us to now in the story, where all of the seeds that Oda has planted have finally come to fruition, and the giant warrior pirates have come to our aid against the biggest threat the crew has faced to this date. But how could such an unlikely scenario such as this actually play out? Honestly, this seems like some sort of dare I say, divine intervention. In fact, maybe the warriors of Elbath aren't nutjobs after all, as it would appear that the sun god figure that they worship seems to actually exist. This actually ties in perfectly with the giant's explanation of their battle back on Little Garden. According to them, if two giants come to a disagreement, they'll be forced to battle each other to the death, and allow their sun god Nika to determine the fate of the battle and choose a victor. But in this case, it would seem that Nika had other plans, calculating the odds and guiding fate to bring his new sovereign together with the giants. What if there's more to Nika's divine protection than we thought, and instead of blessing only one of the giants, he chose to give his divine protection to both of them, ensuring both of their safety and allowing them to battle with every ounce of their strength to their heart's content over tens of thousands of battles elongating the usual process and keeping Dory and Bragi on the island until the day the next Joy Boy would arrive. And as anything in life, this action would have consequences. But at the end of the day, if not for each of these tragic results, the fate of the entire world would be in jeopardy. So in my opinion, this case is closed, and the negative effects of their actions are far outweighed by the positives that will come as a result of Luffy and the crew surviving Egghead and sailing into the final saga. 
But tell me in the comments what you think. Do you agree that Dory and Bragi are more inspiring than their actions may have initially led on? And more importantly, is everything that's lined up to lead us to this point in the story a mere coincidence or some sort of divine intervention? So please, let me know what you think in the comments below, and if you liked the video, or if I at least kept you entertained for the last 20 or so minutes, then please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. We just recently broke the 4,000 subscriber mark, and I couldn't be more proud of how we're blossoming as a community. So I just want to give a huge shout out to all of you for being awesome. Until next time, thank you for stopping by the Crab Cafe. Uh, yeah.